Hey everybody, Mike here. Today I'm playing Dungeon Degenerates Hand of Doom from Goblin Co. For those who aren't familiar with the game, this is an adventure game, sort of in the vein of Runebound or Journey's Middle Earth or Mage Knight, where you're uh, wandering around an area, trying to survive, become stronger, complete some missions. And the theme of this one is that you're in this empire that's kind of overtaken by malaise and corruption and evil influences. And you are on the outskirts of society. You've actually been imprisoned, arrested at the beginning of the game. And, uh, you know, you're basically trying to write your own story in this campaign that can go in a lot of different ways. Although you can play it one-off. You begin by picking your adventurers. I'm going to have two in this game, although you could play with one. I have the Witch Smeller. See him right here with his little witch-smelling nose and his gun. Every character has a bunch of statistics that are used to uh, roll for tests throughout the game. So agilities for dodging, constitutions for like resisting poison, magic, morale to heal, perception to spot things or hide, strength to fight in melee, you get the idea. Everyone also has some trackers here. So you've got the amount of gold, the Witch Smeller starts with 6. Maximum hit points, 14. Amount of damage, currently 0. Luck, which lets you do rerolls, uh, he starts with 1. And experience, he starts with two. And then finally, we have some items chosen for the character. So he's got a weighted pistol, which uses his perception to shoot at range, but might run out of bullets. And he's got a witch smeller's nose that lets him not be ambushed by heretics and witches. He can smell them coming. Finally, characters start with a skill. Uh, he has intimidate, which lets him basically make a human run away sometimes after he kills somebody else. And skills can be uh, advanced into their mastery form, or you can get other skills as the game progresses. My other character is the Hinterlander. So this is uh, kind of like a hunter guy. He got arrested for poaching. He's got more life than the Witch Smeller. More experience to start, but much less gold and more luck. He's very agile, pretty good constitution, great perception, and kind of generally good stats overall. He's got a hunting bow, so both of my guys are uh, ranged characters right now. And the trail ration he can discard to make us feel fed to get rid of uh, fatigue. And finally, he's got a field craft skill that lets him uh, recover his hit points a little bit more easily. But one final note, they each have a way of gaining more luck. The Hinterlander does it by uh, stealthily avoiding encounters, and the Witch Smeller does it by killing heretics and witches, so it makes thematic sense. Next, you set up the map. Now, here's the uh, big board for Dungeon Degenerates. And note that it's divided into four colored sections. These are pretty important because you're going to be drawing monsters and encounters based on the area you're in. So this is the Lowlands, which is kind of the one that's still somewhat civilized, but it also means there's more lawmen hunting for you. Over here is the Wetlands, the kind of swampy place. The Highlands, that's mostly overtaken by bandits and madness. And then the Badlands, that's really messed up and is uh, kind of conquered by goblins. So generally speaking, you're not going to put much on the board at start, except by the mission you're playing. And for this playthrough, I'm going to show you On the Run, which is the intro mission, and can take you in a lot of directions, as you'll see. You make some choices that'll decide which uh, mission you go to next in the campaign. As you rot in your filthy prison cell beneath the fortress city of Brutalberg, a shady jailer comes to you smelling of cheap gin and rancid oil, offering an illicit deal. He has found something valuable that he needs to keep hidden from his cruel and fanatical commander, the High Magistrate. Unable to leave his post, the jailer offers you your freedom if you will retrieve and deliver a package to his crooked cousin in pigskin port. Will you accept this generous offer, or refuse him and plot an escape on your own terms? Okay, so I could just skip this mission entirely and play a totally different one, so there you go, a choice right out the gate. But let's go ahead and accept his offer, and he gives me all my starting uh, items and GP, gold points, and we're going to go right in. So you'll have some setup rules, and then you'll have some uh, rewards and mission paths you can go, basically like which directions you want to go, but I'll kind of summarize the main things. So the key thing is the soothsayer's head. You know, the flavor text here says, This head of a mummified mystic is the jailer's prized object, which you must deliver to pigskin port if you wish to honor your part of the deal. Imbued with some trace of his magic beyond death, the soothsayer's cold lips whisper sage warnings mixed with utter nonsense in ancient languages. And then there's a fungal parasite, which might infect me from holding a severed head. So looking at the board, I've been told to set out a few things by the game. So first of all, clue six down here at the cross crossroads. By the way, we're going to start in Brutalsburg, the uh, kind of capital of this eastern part of the kingdom. Uh, the crossroads right below us is where the head is buried. So we can go there and dig it up, but we don't have to. Again, like this is a very open-ended game. We can just go somewhere else and say forget it. We also have a starting bounty level, which is three, which uh, measures how much the law people of the kingdom are trying to catch us. We've got a destroyed token on North Hills. Now, it's not actually destroyed, but what that represents is that they've like totally blockaded this off since we've escaped prison. So uh, we can't go by there at all. We have to find other routes. 
We also got some more clues. Uh, three is the stone circle. Uh, when we get the head, he'll tell us that's where he's from, so we can go there if we want to kind of uh, help him out. Over here is Gutfish Ford. That's just a place to run away if we don't want to honor our part of the deal. And then finally, here is Pigskin Port. That's where the guy's cousin is waiting, so if we get the head and go up there, we can get paid some money. Finally, they do have kind of another dragnet over here. These four tokens mean that these roads are being patrolled by lawmen. So uh, while we're there, we have a higher chance of getting into an encounter with them instead of regular monsters. And besides shuffling a whole lot of decks, which I've already done, that's pretty much it. The game sets up again besides the cards uh, very quickly. So a game of Dungeon Degenerates has three phases in each round. First, you have the map action phase, where you basically determine if you'll be uh, sneaking or kind of walking around openly, and you either move or rest generally. Then you have the danger phase, where each group on the map draws one of these danger cards, which will determine basically whether you get attacked. And then finally, if you did get attacked, you'll uh, fight some monsters, maybe have an encounter as well. So our party leader is determined by whoever has the higher morale, which is the wit smeller. And he's going to decide if he wants to be bold or cautious in his map action this turn. Some of the key differences are that when you're bold, you can use advanced movement, like moving all the way along a road straight to the crossroads. If you're cautious, you have to spend one turn just moving to like the middle of the road, and then the next one getting to your actual destination. Also, bold movement will let you move along the river or other kind of things like that. Now, if you're cautious, you have a chance of avoiding enemies a little bit more easily if they do attack you. But again, you move more slowly and you can't really do much else. Once we make that choice, we're usually going to either move or rest. Uh, resting is great if you're in a town to buy stuff. We are in a town right now. You can also heal, get rid of negative conditions, explore, which we'll see in a little bit how that works. But for now, clearly we want to get the heck out of the town where uh, everyone's hunting for us. So uh, let's head down to the crossroads. So the Witch Smeller will do a bold stance. That'll let them do a force march, which again will mean that in a single turn they'll get to the crossroads. And I will note that the Hinterlander could choose to do something else and go a totally different direction. And strategically, that's often a good choice. But for now, I think they'll both go down to the crossroads. Although I guess the Hinterlander could go over to East Bridge and start kind of making a way for them. So by the way, the plan for now is to try to get the head and make it all the way up to Pigskin Port and actually uh, get the money from the cousin because I haven't done that one yet. I've always kind of just, uh, you know, waffled out on the deal. So fastest way will be to get the head from the crossroads, head up to East Bridge, head over to Witch Hill, which is a pretty dangerous place. Um, just to explain the danger levels, which is a very important concept in the game. The orange ones are dangerous places. That's their danger level. And the higher, the worse. Uh, green spaces are uh, settlements that are towns, which are safe from attack, and uh, the higher the better in terms of kind of how prosperous the town is. See, so yeah, if I go to Eastbridge, to Witch Hill, and go up to the Watchtower, and then over to Pigskin Port. So kind of like a little, uh, you know, u turny kind of thing here. So yeah, for now, they're going to stick together. They're going to be bold. They're going to do a force march over to the crossroads. Now, when I force march, I have to do a constitution check for each of my characters to see if they become fatigued. And all that means is that they can't force march again until they rest. Tests in the game are all resolved with two d6 dice, and you have to get equal to or less than your statistic. For my characters, the Wit Smeller has a constitution of seven, the Hinterlander of eight. So the Wit Smeller is not fatigued because he got equal to or less. And the Hinterlander is also fine. Now, if either of them have failed, you can spend one luck at a time to reroll any single die in a check you're doing. Uh, clearly, probably wouldn't have been worth it here anyway, but just to explain how that works. And clue six is there, but we're not going to get to interact with it until we rest at the crossroads, so we'll get to that next turn. Okay, next we draw a danger card. That's the end of the map action phase. If we were resting, we'd take these resting actions, like healing and buying stuff and that kind of thing, but when you're moving, the turn's over very quickly. So we flip over the top danger card. And a few things happen here. So first, the danger increases. This is kind of like the accelerating mechanic in the game that keeps things tense. Creeping things lurk in the dark woodland surrounding the Hunt Lodge. So what I do is I find the Hunt Lodge on the board. Here it is. And if it's a town, a green space, I lower its level. So it's become so dangerous that it is less nice of a settlement and uh, could eventually become a dangerous space because next time it would go from a one green to a one orange. But more commonly, if it's a orange space already, its danger level increases. So like a two would become a three, for example. All right, now this is a special card. Since it has the little uh, hangman's noose here, it means the law is hunting me. 
So normally I would compare the number here, the danger level of the card, to my space. I'm at the crossroads right now, which says fields, because some places just kind of go with like the general area they're in. So the crossroads is part of the fields, which has a danger level of two. So unless I got a card with a one or a two, I would not be attacked in the crossroads. I'm in the lowlands, it's pretty safe. There are patrols all around. But because this has the law icon, I instead check my bounty level of three and see if that is equal to uh, the danger level here on the card. So luckily this is a four, so I'm not getting attacked no matter what. Now, since I'm bold, I could do a check to try to uh, get myself found, like if I wanted to get into a fight, but uh, clearly I don't. Now, if I had been attacked, I'd go down here. If there was an icon here, I'd get an encounter card, which could be a positive or negative thing for me. And then I'd see how many guys are in the group. So here we've got two adventurers in my group currently. So I would draw this many enemies, four enemies. So I'm very lucky that I did not get anything there. And then finally, the turn ends with the encounter phase, but I didn't have an encounter. So that's the end of a turn, very quick. Okay, so my guys are at the crossroads and now they want to dig for the head and that requires them to rest and explore the location. The first action in resting has to always be recovering, which will get rid of all status effects, both positive and negative, and give you a chance to heal wounds. But since we don't have any of that stuff, we can ignore it. Next, if we were in a town like Brutalburg, we could uh, buy items, but we're not. We're just out in the uh, middle of nowhere at the crossroads. We could also get new skill cards or improve the skill cards we had if we had more experience, but neither of us started with more than four and all of them cost at least six, so we can't do that yet. And then finally, we can explore. Now to explore, we have to be bold. So the wit smeller will say we're in bold stance again. And only a single person can explore a location per turn. So if one of them fails, the other one can't also try to explore. Uh, the hinterlander has a perception of nine, so he's gonna go for it. And we succeeded. And we first put a little explored icon on the location and that'll stay there forever. We kind of know the crossroads well now. That won't come into play too much for locations like this, but for uh, towns, it means you get more items when you buy there, so that's nice. And when we see paths a little bit later over here, you'll see that it helps you move a little bit faster. Now, additionally, we dig up the head. Now, the uh, mission told us to hold on to two cards. One of these is the head. One of them is a disease we can get from handling the head. So the hinterlander is going to turn over the top card and see. And okay, we got lucky. So the disease is gone. We did not contract a fungal parasite that goes to the discard pile for the uh, loot deck. And instead we got only the soothsayer's head. So uh, rest, you may pay the soothsayer's head one luck to look at the value of any face down clue on the board. Now in this mission, there aren't any, so he's not really useful. Uh, we're just holding on to him. And you'll see to use the item, items always have a requirement, so you have to have Mag7, Magic, we both have that, or Puritan, which my Wit Smeller is. So we could use this item if uh, we wanted to, but we're not going to worry about it right now. So we have dug up the Soothsayer's head, now we can uh, head up toward Pigskin Port to try to sell it to the cousin. But first we got to check a danger card again. And here we go. Heretical cults meet in secret to conduct blasphemous rites amongst the moss-covered branches of the Witch Wood. And you'll see this little thing that says East Bridge. That's because the Witchwood is a territory, a uh, larger area, and not just a single location. So there are several things associated with the Witchwood. So the East Bridge thing shows that if uh, we had Doom, where like this little hand actually appears on the board and does terrible things, East Bridge is, is where it would go. So the Witchwood is going to increase from a 4 to a 5 danger, and that's not great because that's literally the exact place we're going to go to. And uh, Witch Hill is a 5, the Witchwood is a 5. It's really not a friendly place for us at the moment. As for our encounter, remember we count as being in the fields when we're at the crossroads, so uh, it's a danger level of two. And the card had a four, so we would have had an encounter and three enemies, but we don't have anything again. We're getting lucky and staying under the radar for now. But our luck's probably about to run out, because if we force march over to Eastbridge, you'll see that says Witchwood underneath. We're going to be using the Witchwood's danger level of five while we're there. We could alternatively go down to the graveyard, over to the fishmonger camp, and then uh, sail over the lake to uh, the other side of Tomb Lake, and uh, theoretically head over to the Stone Circle to return the Soothsayer head. But again, I've done that one before. I want to try a new one and get the pigskin port. So we're both going to force march our way to East Bridge, going straight across the road. That's something you can only do on roads, by the way. Paths, you have to move halfway and then all the way. But we're going to have to roll for fatigue. So the Hinterlander's holding the head, by the way. And the Witch Smeller's got a 7 constitution. And he passes. Great. Hinterlander's got an 8. And he does not pass. So he gets this fatigue marker that says no force march on his recovery space. That means that won't go away until he takes a turn to rest. 
Although we have even more options than that, because the trail rations say, discard this card at any time during the map action phase to remove the fatigued and weakened conditions. So uh, if we want to, we can force march again next turn, because uh, we have some food to eat to keep our strength up. But before we can celebrate that, let's see if we attract any danger. Don't forget we're using the Witch Woods danger level of 5 right now, so East Bridge is not a safe place. All right, so the strange and foul-smelling fishmongers whisper heretical schemes in soggy hidden cellars below the fishmonger camp. Maybe it's good we didn't go down here after all because this place is not looking as safe either. So we've got a law card with level one, and our bounty member is three, so definitely uh, this is equal to or lower than that. So we're going to have no encounter. There's no uh, book icon here. And only a single enemy. Now, usually when the values are lower, the number of enemies is lower because, again, you... This would uh, happen even in, like, a weak danger space. And this only applies because I have a little law noose here on East Bridge, or if I was here where the law icon has been added. If I was over in some other part of the area where the patrols aren't active, then I would just fight some regular monsters with this card, not a law monster. All right, so now we're going to get to show you some combat. And we have one law enemy. This is lucky it's only one. Should be pretty easy to defeat. And it is a Watchman. So let's show you some of the key things about the character. So first we've got his values here. He's a one experience enemy who gives you one gold when you defeat him. Experience level is a general sense of how tough they are. It goes all the way up to like five or higher for epic monsters that are really tough. This guy's pretty weak. Next we got his target, which is the character he attacks. The game always determines that. So he's going after the person with the least gold, which right now would be the Hinterlander who only has two. His attack four, which is how much damage he'll try to do every turn. The enemies don't roll. Instead, you roll defense to try to reduce their attack. Zero armor, that would reduce every attack against him. And then five health. Now most monsters have at least one ability. At the top here would be something you resolve when they first come into battle. At the bottom are more constant abilities. So his ability is summon, which means he'll add another monster into the fight. Basically bring a little friend from the law, if he's still alive at the end of the round. But note the icon next to it, which is the settlement icon. That means the Watchmen can only get some help if we're in a settlement, but we're on a bridge with no settlement in sight. We're basically in the woods, so he is all by himself. So he's going to be attacking the Hinterlander, so we'll put him over here. And combat is very simple in that you roll just a single roll to determine everything, but it still has some nice choices in it. And characters resolve their turns in perception order, so the Hinterlander is going to go first and potentially get hurt by the Watchmen, and then the Witsmeller will go second. In combat, barring special abilities, you're going to roll five dice. Two green dice for defense, two red dice for attack, and then a power die that'll apply one way or the other depending on the stance you take. The Hinterlander can choose to either be an assault stance, which will mean he has a better chance of dealing more damage, or guard stance, which means he has a better chance of defending himself. Now with us outnumbering this guy two to one, I don't see much uh, reason to take risks. So let's go ahead and go into guard stance with the Hinterlander. So let me roll the dice and I'll explain how it all works. So first we're going to look at the agility. This is a great roll, by the way. So defense is related to your agility. So you need to roll equal to or under your agility to basically dodge attacks. And how a lot of these rolls work in the game is you see what the higher value die was once you pass. So here I rolled two fours, so it doesn't matter. But a four is the higher value die, which means I would block four damage from every enemy attacking me because I passed. Now, if I had failed the test, rolled a 9 compared to his agility of 8, then I would have been hit for the full damage of the guy unless I'm in guard stance where the power die will stop one enemy's attack. So let's say that I failed my roll and got attacked uh, by two different monsters for four damage each. This three would stop three damage from one of them, but I'd take the full, full four damage from the other. And again, if you're not in guard stance and you fail your agility die, everyone hurts you completely fully. The uh, purple doesn't help you at all. Now, when I do pass my test, like I did here, if the purple die was higher, like let's say I rolled a 6, I could substitute that as my dodge value. So I'd pass with the 8, but I'd actually subtract 6 damage from everybody attacking me. And it goes the same way if I do an assault stance. I'm comparing this to my attack trait, which with a hunting bow is agility, so that's an 8. So we did hit with a 7 or less. And um, he would compare the higher value, that's how much damage he does. So here with a 6 and a 1, he's dealing 6 damage to the guy and killing him straight out. But if I was in Assault Stance, I could use the Power Die instead if it was a higher value. If all that seemed complicated, it's actually pretty simple. You'll see it in a lot more combats and it should make sense pretty quickly. 
But yes, the Hinterlander did not want to be captured again. He stopped all four of the Watchmen's damage and then did six damage with his bow in a single attack. So this guy's immediately defeated. So the Hinterlander takes him as a trophy, which just means he gets his reward. So the Wit Smeller gets nothing for this combat. And he gets one experience and one gold. So let's move both those sliders up. He has uh, three gold now and five experience. And then the card is discarded. You only keep it uh, while you're seeing what your reward is. And then after combat, you always have the chance to loot. And uh, you need to roll equal to or less than the experience of total of all the cre creatures you defeated. So I defeated a single 1 XP guy, so I need a 1 to loot, and I don't get it. So I didn't find any items. Now, a fun thing about the game is that the danger levels adapt to your play. So if I just, like, killed some roving wolves or something, the witch would actually would have been become uh, one safer because I was taking care of the enemies that were plaguing the area. Unfortunately, defeating the law enforcement of the area does not have that effect. So the danger level just stays where it is. Okay, so we're going into our next turn. We could choose to rest to get rid of the Hinterlander's fatigue or the witch smeller could just go on without him while he rested. But I think the Hinterlander is going to eat his trail ration, get rid of that fatigue, and let's just keep on going. Because as you can see, every single turn, the danger level goes up. And in the campaign, it doesn't go down. Like, you don't reset it when you go into your next mission. If the world has become ridiculously dangerous because you took your sweet time, it stays that way. So uh, we're going to keep on uh, marching on to Witch Hill. We're going to uh, force march, getting straight past that uh, little noose there of patrols, and go right into the middle of the forest. So we once again have to roll for fatigue. The Witch Smeller has a 7 constitution. Passes again. He's uh, definitely keeping up. And the Hinterlander has an 8 constitution. And he's also fine. So we're ready to force march again next turn. So this time Witch Hill is its own location. It does not use the Witchwoods level. But either way, they're both 5. So let's check our danger card and see if any new friends show up. Carrion feeding vermin and depraved lunatic cults infest the graveyard. It's interesting that almost everything we've drawn has been in the lowlands, the place that's supposed to be the safest, but man, it's not looking nearly as safe right now. Okay, and we dodged a bullet here. This is a six. Our bounty is not a uh, six or higher, and our danger level is not six or higher, so we're missing this card entirely. But you'll see in the icon we have a skull and a single. I mean, that's an epic monster, and these guys are ridiculously dangerous. So I'm uh, really happy we're not fighting one of them right now. All right, well, this is kind of still a uh, sort of blessed journey. I'm just going to keep on force marching right to the Watchtower, which only has a danger level of three. So I, by uh, rushing through, I've kind of completely missed the dangers of the Witchwood, which is fabulous. Now, just to show you, this place is kind of bordered in purple. That shows that it's a main road that you can force march on. Notice the brown here, if I was going up to Gutfish 4, that's a path. I have to spend one turn just going to the middle of it, and another whole turn getting to actually uh, Gutfish Forge. Although if I rested here while I was there and explored, and it had an explored icon, I would kind of chart out the path, and then I could force march very quickly back and forth. But hey, let's head to the Watchtower. We're just one step away from Pigskin Port. All right, and check in for that force march. Our Witch Smeller is fine. Needed a seven or less. Hinterlander is also fine. Wow. And we've got a three danger level now, much less intimidating. Although not too lucky for us anyway. Pilgrims have been vanishing and the dead go missing from the vast crypts dug beneath the Holy Order. Man, another negative place in the lowlands. We're just never going back there. So some cards have different uh, danger levels based on the type of location you're in. So if you can see it, the watchtower has this little like person in a house icon. That means that it's an indoor location. Which here means that we're looking for a danger level of two or less. And, I mean, we have three, so we're definitely getting attacked. And, oh, man, attacked pretty roughly, too. So we've got an encounter. I'll show you what that looks like. And we're getting three enemies. So we're definitely going to get to test out and show off the combat system right here, one step away from our goal. So we always draw the encounter first because it might have an impact on the fighting. In this case, it's, again, one that does different things. If we were in a metaphysical space, basically, like, in kind of these realms of the mind, we'd have to deal with Maze of Madness. But we're not in a metaphysical space, so instead we're dealing with the Shadow of Doom. So it does say Resolve immediately, so uh, if it didn't, we would check it after we defeated the enemies, but here we have to look at it right away. You gaze to the north as the sky darkens. In your mind, the Temple of Madness looms above you as it casts its shadow over the worst strike. You can feel its sinister influence gradually crushing your will. So we, oh man, increase the danger level of the Temple of Madness right away. And hey, you know, it's got to be a nice place if it's got a name like the Temple of Madness. Now, it is up to a 6. If a place that's already at 6 would have its danger level increase again, 
you instead get a Doom token on this Doom track you can kind of see over here in the right. And if you get six of those, you lose the game immediately. This uh, evil necromancer that's kind of running things into the ground has won. But in sort of an Arkham Horror-ish kind of way, the Hand of Doom shows up here and does some terrible stuff to the area, but you can go and like kind of dispel it if you want to and fight back against the Doom. All right, finishing up this Shadow of Doom, each adventurer in the Highlands, that's us, because the Highlands is the entire yellow area, must make a morale test. If you fail, you become demoralized and suppressed. Yuck. So the Witch Smeller is moral as heck, but the uh, Hinterlander, not so much. Witch Smeller needs a nine or less. He makes it. Hinterlander needs a six or less. Ooh, he does not succeed at all. And don't forget, I could use luck to reroll one die at a time and maybe like try to get a one here, but that seems pretty foolish. So he becomes uh, demoralized and suppressed. Demoralize is minus one morale, which probably won't matter unless he's trying to heal later. And suppress is minus one magic, which again, won't matter too much for him. Unless otherwise specified, all effects last until you rest. If he's going to the little recovery area here, messing him up. And now let's check out our enemies. Now this time we're drawing from the three Highland Monsters deck. And just to show you, by the way, um, there are tougher monsters in each encounter deck with a three experience or higher. And you take all these out into the discard pile. I just have them underneath right now at the beginning of the game. So basically you make sure you can't fight the toughest people right out of the gate. Uh, you have to wait a little while before that happens. But I'm getting three enemies keyed to my location, the Highlands. Let's see what they are. So we've got first a Bloodsport Bruiser. Uh, just a one XP guy. Four attack, five life, no armor. He has a Noi, which means whoever he's targeting is going to be forced to guard every round until he's defeated. He's going against the person with the most strength, which is the Hinterlander with seven. So that's one enemy on him. Next, we have the Tooth Taker. That's disturbing. <laughs> uh, also only one XP, also only four uh, attack. He's attacking the person with the least constitution, which is the Witch Smeller. And that's not great because he has the Pain ability, which means every time he damages the Witch Smeller, he has a chance of stunning him, which uh, basically takes away that purple power die. So not too much fun there. And finally, we have the Back Alley Bruiser. Another one XP, so we're lucky we didn't get anybody tougher. And he's got Onslaught, which means that he uh, hurts you more if you are guarding. He's uh, got four attack, only four life, and he's with the truth, uh, the Tooth Taker on the Wit Smeller because he's targeting the person with the least strength. Now, I do want to call out the Intimidate skill of the Wit Smeller. It says quick action, so you can do one of those either before or after your attack every round. And he has to be in Assault Stance. Notice the icon here. If you destroy an enemy this round, choose a target bandit or heretic with XP value 1 and make a morale test. Note that all of these guys are bandits. It's in their little, uh, you know, uh, text you can't really see up there. So if I make a morale test and my single highest die is equal to or greater than the guy's remaining life, they are defeated automatically. They basically just intimidate them and they run away. So if, for example, the Wit Smeller kills, I don't know, the Tooth Taker in the first round, I could uh, intimidate the Back Alley Bruiser and make him Vamoose. I wouldn't get his experience in gold, but at least he'd be out of our hair. Okay, so the Hinterlander is first, and he has to guard because the Bloodsport Bruiser is annoying him. He cannot choose to assault. He's got his hunting bow that checks his agility, has no other special abilities. So he's uh, rolling through with an 8 for defense and an 8 for attack, since it's all based on his agility. And all right, so here's an example. We fail the agility test, which means normally we would block no damage, but because we're guarding, we get to use the power die to block, and four damage cancels the Bloodsport Bruiser's entire four attacks. We take no damage. And then the Hinterlander did hit. He rolled an eight or less, and the higher die is a four, so he does four damage to the Bloodsport Bruiser, one less than enough to kill him outright. We just mark that with these little wound tokens. Now, coming over to the Witch uh, Smeller, I could try to intimidate them, but with two guys on me, I think guarding is probably the better idea, even though the back alley bruiser will do plus one damage with his onslaught. So I'll roll. He's rolling for an agility to defend, an eight, and a perception with his gun to hit. By the way, show his pistol. It is perception. He ignores one armor, but they don't have any. If he rolls a 12, he's out of ammo and has to punch for the rest of the fight. And if he's in Assault Stance, he can use his Strength to attack, but why would he want to? And here we go, looking for those eights. So Defense works out fabulously. We've got seven, that's uh, equal to or less than eight. And with either the Power Die or our Highest Die, we're stopping five damage. So that means even with the plus one damage from Onslaught, we take no damage. Because as long as you pass your check, remember it applies equally to everyone. So each of them gets minus five damage. 
And then our attack hit as well, but not for much. Oh, shoot. I should have said who I was attacking. Uh, who would I have attacked? I guess the Tooth Taker being able to stun me is annoying. So let's say I would have attacked him. So that's two damage. He's got three left. And last time, things were already over after the first round. But if things aren't finished, then you just go into another round. As your action, you can try to run away. But why would I need to here? I'm going to crush these guys. Okay, back to the Hinterlander. He still has to guard because the guy's annoying him. All right, and wow. Once again, fabulous defense roll to totally block everything. Five damage block. The guy only has four. And great attack roll, too. A five and a three is eight, which is equal to or less than his agility. He's doing five damage. The Bloodsport Bruiser only had one, so he is done and uh, gets flipped over as a trophy. We'll just kind of hang on to him for uh, the end of the combat. Back over to the Wit Smeller. I could go to Assault Stance, but it doesn't seem wise when two guys are on me. All right, so um, I've got a five that does equal or less than my agility, so I would stop four damage or four with the power die, so four either way. That does mean with Onslaught adding one to this guy's attack, I take a single damage. You just slide this up. If it ever reaches your heart, your uh, maximum life, then you are defeated. And then another great roll. Sorry, I'm attacking the Tooth Taker again, I should have said. I also hit. I'm rolling on fire today uh, for four damage. He only had three life left, so he is destroyed. If I was in Assault Stance, I could now roll Morale to try to get rid of the Back Alley Bruiser with Intimidate, but I'm not, so I can't take that option. Okay, so the Hinterlander is first again. He has no reason now to be in Guard Stance. He can go into Assault because he doesn't have to even roll his defense dice. He's only attacking my guy. So don't forget, if I hit, I'm going to take the higher of the highest red die or the power die and deal that much damage. Oh, but we don't need it. Wow, five damage. The back alley bruiser is defeated before he even gets a chance to attack the wit smeller. Uh, combat is simultaneous with guys on you, but not if you defeat someone uh, when you have higher perception. So that becomes a trophy for the hinterlander. So looking at our combat rewards, all these guys are one experience and one loot. Makes it pretty simple. So the hinterlander goes up to seven experience and five gold. The wit smeller goes up to three experience and seven gold. And then we each get to roll for loot. The Wit Smeller needs a one. Nope. Oh, I wish that was the Hinterlander's roll. And the Hinterlander needs a one or a two because he defeated two experience worth of guys. Ah, come on. Now this time we did not fight the law, so we do decrease the danger level of our area. The Watchtower is down to a danger level two because we fought off all these bandits that were roaming the area. Well, amazingly, we're already going to get to Pigskin Port because neither of my guys is fatigued, so we can force march right to our destination. So let's roll for fatigue, although it shouldn't matter because we're going to rest in a second. The Wit Smeller needs a 7 and gets it. He has never missed. Hinterlander needs an 8 and also fine. Now we are in a town with a town level of 3 and there is no noose icon. So the uh, law doesn't reach this far to Pigskin Port. What that means is it's impossible for us to be attacked by this danger card because they can't attack you in town unless it's the law coming for you. But we still have to flip it to see which location becomes more dangerous. Wow, thank God we got out of there. Witch Hill. They say by moonlight you can see spectral witches dancing and cackling in the ghostly flames high atop the haunted Witch Hill. So it would have been a very tough fight if we were there with either the law or monsters. Witch Hill goes up to six. We have two locations that are not in a good way. Okay, so now we can rest in the town, and bold or cautious still matters because with a bold stance, we can buy stuff in the town and explore the town to kind of familiarize ourselves with it. Uh, with the cautious stance, we can't do pretty basically anything except rest. So we're going to be bold. The Hinterlander doesn't need to roll for recovery because he's not hurt, but he does get to get rid of all of his status effects, so he's not demoralized or suppressed anymore. The Wit Smeller has one wound, so he can roll to get rid of it. How it works is you have to roll equal to or less than your morale. If you do, you heal your morale. So the Wit Smeller would heal nine damage in one go. If you fail that test, you still heal, but half your morale rounded up. So five for him. So clearly I don't really need to roll. I'm going to get that one damage gone no matter what. Now the Hinterlander has seven experience. Note the Fieldcraft skill he already has has a six experience. So he can spend six to flip it to its advanced mastery version. He still can heal more easily with constitution instead of morale. But additionally, this is something we didn't see, but he doesn't have to roll when he's trying to stealthily avoid a danger encounter, which we didn't get to see, but basically means that he can treat the danger level on the card as though it were one higher, so uh, less likely to actually hit us. So sure, he'll do that just to show how that works. That's the improvement action. He goes down to one XP, and now he's got the mastery version of this. 
We can also try to explore here, and that works the same. We're trying to roll perception. But in this case, uh, exploring the place means that we can draw more items when we try to buy there, not that uh, like we can move faster or whatever. So let's go ahead and try the Hinterlander. It needs a nine. And he gets it, so this place is explored. Now the town level is three, that means if we wanted to buy some stuff, we would uh, go ahead and draw three cards, but with the explorer we can draw four. Although I forgot, I'm supposed to be doing this in character order. So the wit smeller would have been first. He would have recovered and then he might have tried to buy, and that's before the hinterlander explored. So we'll say that we did that. He'll draw only three cards. That means the hinterlander will have to see the same three cards. So we draw three cards from loot, and these can attack you or give you diseases, so they're not all nice. We've got an elixir of life to fully heal when we're resting for six money. A shrapnel bomb to deal a bunch of damage to every monster for three money. That's nice. And then, okay, we just got a lot of bombs. A flash bomb, uh, three money to daze every monster until the next turn. That means they do half damage. But it might also blind us. I think the shrapnel bomb looks pretty awesome. Let's buy that for three. I'll take him down to four, he can just hang on to it, and it is a combat action, which means that he would have to uh, not attack the turn he threw it, and instead his only action would be to throw the bomb. Okay, so now we go to the Hinterlander, and uh, he could buy these things as well, although he doesn't have enough gold yet, but we're going to sell the Soothsayer's head, so let's do that and see how much gold we get. Okay, and the mission check says that he pays us 2d6 gold split evenly among us, let's hope it's high. Not too bad, eight, we each get four. That puts the Hinterlander up to nine, and the Wit Smeller up to eight. So he has enough to buy the Flash Bomb or the Elixir of Life. I think the Flash Bomb is not bad because it is a quick action, which means I can throw this for free and still attack that round. So let's buy that for three. So he's down to six GP. And additionally, the scenario says we each gain one luck. So we're up to uh, two for the Wit Smeller and four for the Hinterlander. So here, because we delivered the head into Pinkin's port, it says if you delivered the soothsayer's head to the jailer's cousin, he's appreciative enough to set you up with a job working for the River Rats gang. You may continue on to Death for Hire, that's uh, the scenario on page six, or refuse this work and attempt to establish a base. Death for Hire sounds pretty awesome. Um, you know, we're not very nice people, so I think going around and working for an evil gang in the uh, lawless waste is kind of fun. Although I don't know how much my wit smeller would appreciate that, but hey, he was a criminal anyway. He's not a pure person. So yeah, we'll say we go on to that. So if we wanted to stop here, we could, uh, they have these forms you can fill out. We'd remove all the tokens that got placed at the beginning. So like the North Bridge wouldn't be closed down anymore. All those extra tokens wouldn't be there. But otherwise, again, all the stuff, like the danger levels would stay the same. The Witchwood would still be this terrible place. You know, we wouldn't, wouldn't become nicer just because we stopped playing. But we could also just continue immediately and go right into the next scenario. They tend to be pretty quick. I played an entire campaign of four scenarios in about like uh, three or four hours. So it uh, could happen very fast. So that is Dungeon Degenerates. It was a quick playthrough, but you got to see uh, bigger combat. You got to see how leveling up works, how buying works, how kind of the missions are structured. Although they are varied quite a bit and let you see a lot of different stuff. So I hope you enjoyed it. Go check out the review for my thoughts and we'll see you at the next stop.